these three people got in common? Men. <laughs> yes, they're all white men. And can I, you are absolutely right. Can I say that NPL right now is very much into uh, diversity and inclusion, and we are trying to shed this image that all people that work at NPL are white, male, have glasses, uh, and are of an age. And I'm, unfortunately, as outreach manager, I go out and talk to thousands of people to, and do very little to dispel that um, misapprehension. But I do have a wonderful team of people who work with me, uh, representing all types of uh, background and gender and whatever. Um, and so uh, that is very much a thing that we're doing today. But you are so right. Well done for spotting the whole male, white, man syndrome thing. Anyway, they have got something in common. A bit of a clue. Look, look at the picture of Adam. There's a building behind him. That's Bushy House. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'll come to the real answer a little bit later. I'm going to go through a little bit of history about uh, Bushy House uh, through its inhabitants. And if we're talking about the first inhabitant, that would be the gentleman that built the place. So this is Edward Proger, who was a, a, a friend of Charles II uh, and supported him when he was in exile in France. And when they came back into England, uh, Charles II said, thank you for supporting me. Because you've been such a good friend and a good aide, I will now give you some land and give you some money and you can just build yourself a nice house. And in 1633, the, the building of the nice house began. And that's Bushy House. And uh, Edward Proger went to the treasury and said, well, I've started construction. Can I have the money now? Uh, and the treasury said, well, the king agreed it. We didn't. <laughs> and for the next 30 or 40 years, this argument raged on. Uh, and it, there was £4,000 involved, which is the equivalent of about £600,000 today, which is how much it cost to build. Uh, and eventually, it, the, um, Edward got some money. They said, we'll give you... Uh, uh, 400 a year as a sort of pension, and that can go towards it. So after 10 years, you got the money that the king said you could have. Uh, Edward, unfortunately, only lasted three more years. He only saw three years' worth of that money, um, and he died in the process of cutting his third set of teeth, which I think is what we call wisdom teeth. But he, he was quite of quite an age, is it 80, 88 years old? So he did pretty well. This is uh, the person that then took over he was the first Chancellor of the Exchequer and he purchased quite a large amount of land uh, in uh, all, all the parks in this area uh, and he was, yes, Chancellor of the Exchequer and he was the guy who invented the national debt as an idea. I'm not quite sure whether that was part of the, the way that he managed to fund uh, his works here but he increased the size of Bushy House um, and that, that what was carried on by his uh, son uh, this is George. Then along came Lord North, more white men. Um, and uh, yes, uh, there's not really much I can say about him. It says here he was a member of parliament, a junior treasury lord. Oh, and another chancellor of the exchequer. So this was, this was where the chancellors hung out. This is quite good. So obviously quite good security. Um, now, now I come to my favourite of all of the people I think that lived here. Uh, this is William, who was the third son of George III, okay? And uh, he was third in line for the th throne, so he wasn't even the spare. You know, the heir and the spare? He was the spare spare. So age 13, he was uh, sent to sea, a midshipman. There he is, decked out. Uh, he used to hang out with Admiral uh, Nelson. He became quite friendly with uh, Lord Nelson and um, went around in the seas. He was a bit of a lad, he was a bit of a joker, uh, he was a drinker, a womanizer, and um, earned the nickname Silly Billy. <laughs> but when his elder brothers started to die off, suddenly the, the establishment started to get a little bit worried uh, that he should you know, be a little bit closer to home. So he stopped being just William and started to be called um, William Duke of Clarence. 
and uh, he was given this house, bushy house, to live in. And I don't know if you see this little folly in the, in the gardens, and next time you're in there, have a look at that. Buried somewhere in there is a part of the mast from HMS Victory, from the days of um, you know, working uh, with, with Nelson. So I think these pictures, well, the one, this picture here, I think they're actually clearing the space to build this thing there. He didn't really have much to do, as people in waiting uh, have, as, as royals in waiting have. And so, like most people, I guess, he just went into town and went to the theatres and had a laugh. And he genuinely fell in love with this lady here, Dora Jordan. Have you heard of Dora Jordan? There's a Dora Jordan Road. Okay. Um, she was not interested in him initially. It took two years of um, charming behaviour before she eventually agreed to go out with him. Uh, but then it was a real love match. It really was genuine. Um, his father was kind of okay with it. And they set up in Bushy House and had a whale of a time. They had ten children who mostly survived. I think seven of them survived. Uh, there they are written in such tiny writing that you can't read, but there they all are. Uh, they were all given the surname Fitzclarence. Clarence? Is that a name that rings a bell, I think? The, the Clarence Pub. And those people that we saw earlier on <laughs> are the great, great, great grandchildren of some of these people whose names are up there now. Oh. Royal tea, Ooh. living on the doorstep, and we've got <laughs> famous people living on the doorstep. It didn't last forever, this beautiful romance, um, because uh, it looked as though William might end up actually becoming king. So unfortunately, Dora was packaged off. Uh, the children, a couple of the children, still remain living in the house with um, William, uh, but uh, Dora went abroad, uh, was given some money, but uh, it was squandered by a relative and she died penniless, which I think is quite a sad ending to all of that. Uh, whereas her ex-partner then was married to uh, Princess Adelaide. Local pub? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and they had one, two, three, four, five children, none of whom survived which is really quite sad actually. It was announced that the horse came from London, it arrived at Bushy House, and those fateful words, the king is dead, long live the king, were stated. And at that point, William, <sighs> lad that he was, gave the immortal quote, something along the lines of, right, I'm going upstairs, because I've never slept with a queen. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> they moved out of uh, uh, Bushy House and moved to the more glamorous Windsor Castle. And there's a crest. It's not as glamorous and complicated as this. Uh, there's an emblem on the, on the ceiling of one of the rooms in Bushy House. And I've noticed that exactly the same emblem is on the ceiling of one of the rooms in Windsor as well. So you can see where they literally move from one ceiling to another. Um, I should say that Adelaide, after William died, actually moved back in there, and she, I think, died at Bushy House. The next thing happened, and we had the Duke of Nemours. Uh, has anyone seen the, the Victoria TV series? There's a, there's a bit in there where it talks about the fact that she's looking after all of the people that have escaped France um, because of the revolution that was going on. And this was one of these people. He was actually in line to be um, the, the king of Belgium, but his father declined uh, uh, the coronation on his behalf because he thought, if, if this guy gets crowned, that's it. He, they'll kill him. The masses will kill him. So he came over to Britain to escape the revolution and was put up by Queen Victoria in Bushy House. So it was kind of refuge. Uh, where he stayed for several years. Eventually he felt it was safe to go back to Paris. He did, but he left his family here and, and sort of kept the house until um, the late 
seven, late 1870s, yes, 1871 is when he left here. But his family stayed on till 96, so that's why I've got these two dates up there. And then it became the National Physical Laboratory. I'll explain how that little bit was set up, but this would have been the next person who took up residence in there. It was the first director of NPL, uh, Richard Glazebrook. Royal Society is kind of a uh, big science facility. They, they uh, pay for Brian Cox's wages, amongst other things. <laughs> uh, big science club, um, very diverse now, not just old men with beards. But you can imagine it in, in old, latter days, it would have been the likes of Charles Darwin talking about the, the Beagle and things like that, of his voyages. Uh, but these days, uh, the Royal Society is just a fantastic science club. It really is. Um, and they're, they're always sort of saying stuff in the press about how science policy should be going, etc. today. So uh, they were asked by the British government to set up a laboratory um, <coughs> to be responsible for units of measurement and for enabling measurement at the very highest uh, precision and accuracy. So this facility was set up. They, they thought about putting in a queue initially and then settled for this bushy house area here. I guess there was quite a lot of area around where it could have expanded, and indeed, obviously, it did. But in 1900, uh, it began. Uh, but before we move on to that, I thought I'd share three bushy house moments with you, okay? Slightly odd, slightly quirky moments. The first is this. My friend Fritz is a professional film extra. And he, said, he, told me the other, he told me once, funnily enough, we were filming down your place the other way, the other day. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, yeah, well, I was in this film Quills, which is about Bedlam, the Marquis de, de, de Sade. And at one point, they used Cannon Gate, which is just over there. They used Cannon Gate as the gateway, if you like, to Bedlam Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> <laughs> and... At one point, they all break loose, <laughs> including my friend Fritz, devoid of clothes, <laughs> running out of here towards the camera going, ah! <laughs> I wish I'd seen that. <laughs> this is odd situation number two. So behind us, just over there, there's another room. And in, what year did we do this? 2011, this is Yan Wong, TV presenter, uh, biology expert uh, at the time he was in a programme called Bang Goes the Theory. The middle chief is um, Simon Hall. Uh, he still works at NPL. Uh, he's a laser specialist. And then the one at the bottom is me. And the three of us uh, filmed a little segment for this TV programme that involved shining a laser along that yellow line that you can see there. So literally across the field from the room behind you into some bushes in the gardens of Bushy House. Uh, we had a laser at this end, and then we had a mirror at the other end, reflecting the light being back. And we had a fancy chopper system, optical chopper system that switched the light on and off and on and off and on and off. And literally, we were able to time how long it took the pulse of light to travel that uh, 600, 300 metres there, 300 metres back. And from that we were able to measure, get a value for the speed of light. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we were doing a real proper scientific experiment. Um, it was really, I think it was October, it was cold, there was condensation on the mirror, uh, the, the beam. It was, it was not easy, but we did get an answer after about, um, I think it took us three hours just to get one result. And the third incident is this one here. You, you recognise the guy on the left? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I think this was 1990... No, it was two, 2000, I think? Yes, 2000. Uh, Prince Charles visited us. And uh, he, he landed his helicopter in the middle of this field here. Somebody cleverly cut the grass, especially for the event, so bits of cut grass went absolutely everywhere. There was a phenomenal racket of a noise. The local residents complained about the noise. They said, what's this helicopter landing in our back garden? No one told us this was going to happen. We said we were told not to tell anybody because it's royalty. And then the local residents said, oh, that's okay then. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, he came and visited us, and uh, he, he spent a little bit of time looking around Bushy House. Um, of course, his uh, relations had lived there all this time ago. Um, part of the deal was actually also that we had to install a special uh, facility for him uh, with a, a, a little ante room uh, so that the gentleman in waiting could be there at the same time that he was um, if he needed to go to the loo. <laughs> so we had to install a special um, royal flush for him. <laughs> um, so NPL in Bushy House. This is the opening event. Uh, by Prince Charles's grandfather, great grandfather, grandfather, great grandfather, um, Prince of Wales, uh, Edward the Seventh, as as became uh, in 1901, and there they all are, looking very dapper and serious. Uh, six years later, there was a party on the lawn, and there they are, all dressed up in their finery, having a great time. The first, the the, the science was done in on the. The, foot, the, the ground floor, there's some work in the cellar. Somebody in this audience I know is doing experiments uh, in, the, in the cellar and, and on the ground floor there today. Um, and the first floor was for the director to live in. And this, this is one of the, uh, this isn't the experiment, this is just to show you one of the experiments that was done. Um, in 1910, we were introducing electric light as a, a way of illuminating houses in a safer way that didn't involve burning a noxious gas that uh, was creating horrible um, smells uh, and was dangerous. Uh, and there were tests done on how efficient, uh, and literally pounds per lumen, um, it was costing to, to create light in offices and later in homes using electric light bulbs. And I think this is interesting because the whole energy efficiency thing is very, very important these days. And here we have a succession of different lighting technologies, each increasingly better at converting electricity into light. And this sort of measurement still goes on today. But to do that, you need to be able to measure light properly and you need to measure electricity properly. Here are some ladies uh, measuring thermometers in the thermometry section. And measurement of temperature is still something very much that we do today. Uh, temperature is absolutely critical in many, many manufacturing and health um, environment situations. So uh, there, there they are. And you can see a little row of thermometers along there, in, in the bottom there. So you can literally imagine her putting one after another onto this device and, and uh, making sure that the markings, I think this, is a, this literally scratches on a mark uh, to show when uh, something is at exactly the right temperature. Uh, this is the office, I think, in 1932 on the first floor, so this would have been the director's office. So there's a wonderful book called Pyat, which talks about uh, NPL up to, I think, about 1965. And within that book, there's a lovely series of illustrations about how the site was developed. So uh, this is as it was uh, when, when NPL got the site in the first place. So you can see lots of nice fields everywhere. Um, to put it into context, can you see a little curve? Yeah. Mm. That's uh, Queen's Road. Um, okay. Yeah. So there's fields absolutely everywhere. It's beautiful, isn't it? And a lovely um, uh, lake, mini lake. You can <coughs> imagine maybe there are fountains on it, I don't know. Uh, just in front of the view, and this sort of line going like that. Now, I have to say that pretty much all of those buildings are still there in one shape or form. Can you see the vinery there? It's called the orangery, but we have vines inside it. Mm. Uh, and then you've got that little cottage that, on that corner there. I think you might be able to see that out the window. Uh, that, some of the other buildings are there as well. Let's move on a few years, maybe 10 years later, and we're starting to see that Bushy House is not enough to contain all the science that needs to be done. And I think each one of these images is taken 10 years after the last one, more or less, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Now, can you see these, this long thing in the corner there? That's a ship tank, where a, a really long little mini lake, uh, where you could put model pontoons and model boats, and you could investigate how, how well they were engineered. And then another really significant building, sorry, I haven't got a laser, it's somewhere in the middle, which was a giant air, um, wind tunnel where you could put model aircraft and see how well their aerodynamic design um, was working. 
but you can just see how each building is getting, there are more and more buildings. We got up to num building number 95, I think, uh, but I don't think there were actually 95 buildings, I think it's more like about 50, but it still just grew and grew and grew. So now we're starting to get numbers there. Uh, a second ship tank was built uh, in the 19, by 1940, obviously, uh, and there famously Barnes Wallace bouncing bomb testing took place. Uh, 1950, uh, 1960, <laughs> and this is the modern version, <laughs> which I pulled off a 3D Google thing, uh, and you can see how in the 90, in, in the late 1990s, all of these buildings around got demolished. Really, uh, part of the planning. Uh, uh, arrangements were that um, Admiralty Way would be built over what used to be the Admiralty Research Establishment, which kind of became its own entity in itself on the top, on, on the right hand side. Uh, and then also we have now the Laboratory of the Government Chemists, which is the um, one, two, three, four, five things, six things over there. Uh, so it's not just National Physical Laboratory, there are several other things located within here now. Um, and our newest building is this rather curvy thing, which you can see with photovoltaic uh, cells on the roof there. That's our advanced quantum metrology building. Uh, so that's rather splendid. Okay, let me talk a little bit about NPL, what it is. I, I feel in a way we are misnamed. Um, it's called the National Physical Laboratory, and so a lot of people think we just do physics. Uh, I should say that actually that stands for physical sciences, so things that you can hold in your hand and tangible things. Uh, I think we should really have been called the National Measurements Laboratory because that really is what we do all day, every day. Uh, at the current moment, about a thousand people all measuring different um, materials and, and their properties. And this is the formal slide that uh, I would show if I was doing a very formal presentation. We, are, we were established in 1900, you know. Uh, we are a public corporation owned by the department uh, associated closest to science. The actual government department changes its name every few years, but that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, not just in Teddington, we also have uh, strategic alliances with Surrey and Strathclyde University. And uh, as a result, we have people working there. Uh, also at, Su at Cambridge and Huddersfield and Solid Health. We've got quite a couple of um, laboratories in Huddersfield. And we also have 200 people having their PhDs co-supervised by NPL's members and staff. So um, an enormous amount of knowledge generation happening throughout the whole of the UK uh, just to get measurement to work better for us. And uh, it says here 800 plus scientists. And why? Why has this been why is there this ongoing need to do measurement properly? Um, you, you think about the utilities and you think of water coming into your house and electricity and gas coming into your house. You take these things for granted, that the water is pure, that the gas is what it ought to be and it's not got leaks on it, and that the electricity is what it ought to be, 240 volts or whatever, at 50 hertz. Uh, it, it, all of the equipment in your house trusts that this is the case. And if it wasn't, things would go very, very wrong. But even a deeper utility than all of this is measurement, this infrastructure that ensures that a second is a second, a metre is a metre, and a kilogram is a kilogram. Engineering, medicine, um, trade, industry, just would fall apart if we did not have this secret utility that was international measurement. And that is really what we are all about. So I've got this next little bit, it's called MPL and U, and this is about <coughs> public interfacing with uh, MPL today. So I'm MPL's outreach manager. I try to get uh, young people enthusiastic about uh, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And we have lots of public events that um, help them understand the value of what it is that we're doing and actually get excited and consider working in uh, making the world a better place through um, science and engineering. So this is one of my big events of the year. This is the NPL Open Day. And this is one of my favorite photographs. This is just someone who came and had a look around and saw a sign that said hardness testing and decided that they were gonna pull that face. <laughs> and that's, you know, she went away and had a, had a good day, had a look around, maybe understood a little bit more about what was going on. 
Uh, on that particular day, uh, this was last year, we had about 2,000 visitors looking around our laboratories in that big white building at the other end of site. I don't know if you know about the water rocket challenge? That's on this very field here. We convert this into a large rocket testing and launching range. And we have about 50 launch bays here and about 30 schools turn up. And their mission is to launch and land a rocket exactly 70 metres away. Not 65, not 75, but exactly 70. So it's like linear darts. And they've got to do this three times, we've got three rounds. And then at the third round, we don't tell them in advance, but actually sometimes we do. They've got to launch and land an egg, a hen's egg, and it's got to survive. <laughs> we will be at Teddington Village Fair in June. I think I will be doing a show there, possibly with Purdy, as shown there, uh, of some of our fun science stuff. Right, I'd like to say a little bit about science if we've got time, and I'll be quite quick about this. So that, that was the old building, this is the new building entrance. If you go through there, you'll... You, you, you can then wander with your security badge and your minder um, into any number of amazing spaces. I think we have about 380 separate laboratory spaces. So this is the largest, maybe. Uh, it's a little bit smaller than this room, but it's really, really impressive. And here we uh, measure how powerful microwave transmitters or how sensitive microwave receivers are um, using a special no echo room. So you don't want the uh, microwave bouncing off the walls. So that's what all of this governance is all about. And I've put some books around. It says 9.99 on the back of it. That's how much they cost. They're, they're for you, free. Here are a few excerpts from those, that book. Um, we've measured lottery balls. Uh, Camelot have a, uh, and they don't run it anymore, someone else does, listen there. But they have a, a special calibration lab where they check that each one of the balls, I guess, weighs the same, but certainly has the same diameter. Uh, and they have rings. One ring is too small for the balls to fall through, and one is just the right size for the balls to fall through. And these, I am told, these lottery balls are checked regularly using these special rings that have been calibrated, checked by us. Yep, I was involved in making sure that tomato ketchup, that its colour is what the people who make it want it to be. <laughs> There's, uh, if you were in a shop and you saw, I don't know, several containers of tomato ketchup and one was greener or yellower or bluer or whatever than the others, forget the, the branding, the labelling, you were picky about that as well, but the product itself, um, the odd one out would be the one you wouldn't choose, come on, be honest. <laughs> So people have thought long and hard about what they want the ideal colour of this stuff to be, and they put additives in here to tweak the colour, um, and then have to maintain that colour through some industrial process. So we helped make sure that, the, that this occurred by, by calibrating machinery that looked at the colour and reported it back, and then by some feedback mechanism, changes the ingredients accordingly. We've measured the um, ripeness of cauliflowers. And you might think, why? <laughs> why have we, 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 so it's an x-ray vision type thing, and it? it can actually look underneath the leaves because you can't see whether a cauliflower is ripe when you're harvesting it because the leaves are over it. So uh, a neat way of actually seeing the degree of ripeness, and um, if they're harvested at the wrong time, they'll just get thrown away, um, is to look at the humidity, the amount of the water content in there. And this could be measured by effectively shining a kind of microwave off, off onto it and bouncing it off it. So it's actually terahertz, which is the same um, frequency as is used in one of these full body scanners that you walk into in an airport. It's a very, very, very soft, if that's the right way of using it, X-ray. Um, and so, yes. And this, this technology, it might sound a bit bizarre and robotic and futuristic -y and why bother, um, but this is saving an, your average Lincolnshire farmer £100,000 a year on just harvesting stuff at the wrong time. We might measure the, the power coming out of these microwave transmitters that we call mobile phones. So there's about one watt coming out of this, out of a mobile phone. Uh, if you really wanted to cause havoc, strap 700 phones to someone's head, ring them all simultaneously, and then that will have the same power uh, as a microwave oven. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> um, you can't claim anything in advertising that hasn't been backed up. 
So if someone says our razors shave closer than anybody else's, somebody has to check that and you can guess where they went. <laughs> so we had such a, a, a material that was a bit like flock wallpaper, you know, that sort of shaggy, velvety feel wallpaper, uh, and a, a method and some razors, and then we had to measure the length that was left after the shaving had occurred. And this brings me to one of my favorite units. I mean, units of measurement are really, really important. Kilogram, a meter, and a second are internationally defined, agreed, and everybody uses the same one. It's bizarre. So it transcends language and culture um, and politics and everything. Uh, but my favorite unit is the beard, the beard second, which is the length that hair grows in one second. <laughs> which people argue could be anything between four and 10 nanometers. So it's not a particularly you know, fixed unit. Uh, we discovered that if you shake Guinness at exactly the right frequency, the bubbles race to the top really, really quickly. And it doesn't take ages to settle. And uh, we're just down the road from Twickenham, aren't we? Can you imagine a match with thousands of pints of Guinness being waited, waiting for them to settle? That must be quite a thing. So the thought of having a, a thing in a pub that just went like that and then the whole thing settled. I have actually seen a branded version of this, but I've never seen a single one in a pub. Uh, and I think the reason is that um, it's part of the mystique, isn't it? Waiting for that thing to settle. You've got to wait. Uh, so uh, sometimes there are solutions for things that some people might perceive as a problem, like the bartender at Twickenham. Uh, but, and you can create solutions, but there are reasons not to use them. We created the world's smallest snowman, I think in 2010. Ah, uh, oh, this slide's gonna just keep leaping, just to keep me on my toes. Uh, it was just to demonstrate some of the amazing science that we can do, and that we can create something so tiny, so tiny. Um, the, the width of his head is about the same as the wavelength of red light. I mean, this thing is absolutely tiny. You can put five of these on the width of a, a human hair. Uh, and I made a fantastic video uh, showing just how small it was and uh, it had thousands of comments. It had about 500 views, sort of 500,000 views, half a million views, which I thought was good for a science video. Um, but uh, that my favorite comment was, world's smallest snowman, I've seen bigger. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I have been involved in measuring colour and light for many, many years. I could do another whole talk on all of that. But this is the bizarrest machine I ever built. It was something to measure the shininess of cats. It's in the book. <laughs> um, because somebody wanted to prove that their um, food, their pet food, made cats' pelts shinier than anyone else's. Uh, so rather than having a panel of people to assess cat pelts, uh, the people might change physically, as in there might be different people uh, from year, year to year. So you need a stability of a decent measuring facility. Uh, just let's, let's make a machine to measure how shiny cats are. So I did. Uh, we measured how crispy biscuits are by listening to the sound they make when you break them. <coughs> there are lots of different ways of doing things. Um, it's, sometimes it's what's the quickest and the easiest rather than the most accurate um, and most expensive approach. Or, or can we do things better? Or do we have to measure things a thousand times when we only need to measure them 500? So uh, there's lots of stuff. I would say that what actually precision measurement does is, um, well, I wear spectacles and without them, I cannot see a thing. But with a higher resolution of measurement, like measuring things at millimetre scale rather than centimetre scales or using uh, water particles instead of um, balls, giant balls. You just see things in more detail. And that means you can do more elegant science, more elegant engineering, with nanobot engineering, and stuff that is just, we might have considered to be science fiction. When there are national challenges and there are security and resilience. These are the areas that we've clustered together, are the ways of thinking about how we can help um, humanity. Prosperity, which is what I might consider to be um, manufacturing things in a more efficient uh, and proficient way. Uh, the environment, of course, is a big thing at the moment. Uh, yes, we are doing loads of stuff on environment. Pollution, uh, we're assessing sea levels, um, 
uh, working on new technologies uh, that reduce consumption of energy and so on. And then health, of course, as well. We have a large project working on cancer, uh, imaging of cancer stuff. <coughs> Nearly finished. This is, I just thought I'd introduce you to a couple of people who work there, just in case you see them in the street with their passes. Tell them to take their passes off. They're not supposed to wear passes uh, when they're walking outside the site. This is Maddie, and she is helping build uh, what we're calling the Truths Satellite. That's this thing here. It's going to measure the brightness of the sun. And you might think, what? <laughs> but actually, we don't know how bright the sun is. It's, it's never been measured properly. Every time we launch a satellite and we measure it, we get a different answer. Uh, the results track previous me uh, measurements on other devices that are also up there, but they never agree. So when the sun gets brighter, all of the readings go higher. When the sun gets duller, all of the readings go down. But none of them are exactly the same. So in 2030, we intend to launch this thing that will unequivocally give us an absolute answer on how bright the sun is and how it's changing, which will inform climate change. This is my friend Purdy. Uh, can you see her reflection in this selfie here? Mm -hmm. This is a piece of a very, very pure silicon that's part of a project to evaluate the kilogram. And uh, this is uh, the new prototype, or part of uh, the, the, the new way of running the kilogram. Previously, it was just a lump of metal, a single object that was the kilogram. And if Weight Watchers built, broke in and smothered it in peanut butter, they would suddenly weigh less. Because by law, that was the kilogram. Today, we're replacing it with a method which is effectively to measure how much electrical power is creating an electromagnetic force, an electromagnet that works against gravity and effectively creates a um, kilogram's worth of force. Does that make sense? Mm. So this method is kind of more universal and it doesn't have to just be a kilogram. It could be half a kilogram or a gram or whatever. Uh, so Purdy is in this team, as is someone else in this audience. I'm feeling slightly <laughs> worried about talking about this in front of me. Giuseppe built a, uh, was involved in a project with an atomic clock, which is sending a time signal down a fibre optic link to Reading University, and he got a really odd result. The, the signal just jittered at one point. It was as if someone was shaking a TV receiver, satellite. It just went very like that. Curiously, at exactly that moment, he got a message from his friends in Italy saying, we just had an earthquake. <laughs> He put two and two together. And now we have a fantastic new way of sensing earthquakes by listening effectively in on the shaking of fibre optic cables. Now we've got cables going underneath the Atlantic, so we can now extend the range of earthquake detectors to places that we've never been to before. We don't. This guy was not supposed to be working on earthquake detection. He was supposed to be working on atomic clocks. And it's kind of nice to, uh, to me that, you know, you can start off doing one type of research and then accidentally fall into something else that could have enormous impact. Uh, and this is Professor Josie Fee Bunch. With, she's got a huge team of people who uh, are working on imaging different elements of the cancer story, from whole body to organs, organelles, uh, cells, and down to... Um, molecular biology, stitching all those images together uh, achieved using a huge range of different techniques to create what they're describing as a Google Earth map of cancer. And this will really weave together many, many te different technologies and different approaches um, so that we can see and tackle medicine in ways that we haven't before. So do you see what I mean about it's not just physics? It's just everything. So thank you, William Proger. For building that, which we extended into that, <laughs> uh, which led to other things that I haven't even mentioned. Alan Turing, the uh, world's first programmable digital computer, uh, the world's first atomic clock, Louis Essen. Look at his smug face. Right? He's, he's got it to work. These were both done in the 1950s. It was a, a glorious moment for us. Um, and then I have mentioned Josie, but you know, there's just so much going on now that we don't tend to look back and think about stuff we have done. We're really, really excited about the future and that's where I'm gonna stop. <laughs>